left to right, thinking she's being very informal. She did actually say something at the beginning. Okay, so a lion, the lion's roar in a troubled world. It's a great title, great title they've come up with for the BAM uh, month this year, and very evocative, and I think very appropriate. So, so I'm going to start with a couple of quotes from the Pali Canon, where the Buddha's, uh, where he talks about the lion's roar, just to give it that context from tradition. So in the Anguttara Nikaya, in the Siha Sutta, which is the lion sutta, Siha being a lion, uh, this is quite a bit of a long quote, so just let it, you know, if anybody's taking notes, don't try and take notes of quotes, because you just end up getting lost, don't you? The lion, the king of beasts, at even time comes forth from his lair. Having come forth, he stretches. Having stretched, he surveys the four quarters in all directions. Having surveyed the four quarters, he utters thrice his lion's roar. Thrice having uttered his lion's roar, he sallies forth in search of prey. Now, whatever creatures hear the sound of the roaring of the lion, the king of beasts, they fall to quaking and trembling. Those that dwell in holes seek their holes, the water dwellers make for the water. Forest dwellers enter the forest and birds mount into the air. Thus potent is the lion, the king of beasts. Of mighty power and majesty is he. Just so when a Tathagata arises in the world, an Arahant, a perfectly enlightened one, perfect in conduct, a world knower, the trainer unsurpassed of those who can be trained, the teacher of devas and humans, a Buddha, an exalted one, he teaches the Dharma. So that's probably one of the earliest references to the Buddha as a lion and the Buddha's teaching as the lion's roar. And then in the Diga Nikaya, there are a couple of sutras. There's the short lion sutra, Short Lion Roar Sutra and the Long Lion Roars Sutra. Uh, the long one, the Maha Sihanada. I'm not going to read the whole thing, just one little quote from it, which I think is quite good. So there's been a whole dialogue that's going on um, between various people and the Buddha. And then at the end, it says, Gotama roars his lion's roar in company and confidently. They question him and he answers. He wins them over with his answers. They find it pleasing. They are satisfied with what they've heard. They behave as if they were satisfied. They are now on the path of truth and they are satisfied with the practice. So I think both of those quotes need a bit of thought really. Um, so I'm not, it's not suggesting that we terrify people into submission, which I think that first long quote can sound a little bit, uh, you know, like the lion comes out of his lair and roars and all the other animals are terrified and run for shelter. So we're not suggesting a practice of yelling for peace or kind of, you know, the bodhisattva practice of shouting at people. Which I have to say, when I was a younger woman, I probably would have ascribed to that practice. I was one of these people that sold communist, gave out communist literature at street corners and shouted at people, uh, telling them that they weren't, you know, in it for peace or whatever. So it was very, very ineffective. So just, so that's not what's been suggested. I think the second shorter quote is probably more useful and I'm gonna come back to that before the end of the talk. But I think the main thing about the first one, the, the main quality that that's, there's a couple of qualities. I think one quality is fearlessness. So I think one of the things it's saying is that the Buddha is likened to the king of the beasts because there's a fearlessness there. When the lion is the king of the jungle, fears no other animal and uh, they're pretty majestic and pretty kind of, uh, yeah, they take up their space, don't they? They're often seen as a heroic animal in uh, heraldry. The lion is seen as uh, as heroic. 
Scotland win a Scotland's heraldic crests as the lion rampant. You get the lion changed into a dragon in Wales. You get there's all sorts of um, relationships with a dragon that with with a lion that bring out that heroic quality. And thinking of heroism, I'm just going to read you a little bit from a much later sutra, uh, the Ratnaguna Samchayagatha, which is a sutra of the Mahayana. Uh, sorry, I don't know most of you, so I have no idea what level of experience or uh, well, I know some of you quite well, but some of your faces I don't know. And so I'm not sure if some of the things that I'm talking about might be new or unfamiliar. So if they are, then I suggest that there'll be time at the end for a question or two, or you follow it up with Lali Taraja in another class. So, so the Ratnaguna Samchayagatha is a much later text, and um, it starts like this. Call forth as much as you can of love, of respect, and of faith. Remove the obstructing defilements and clear away all your taints. Listen to the perfect wisdom of the gentle Buddhas, taught for the wheel of the world, for heroic spirits intended. I really love this. This is one of my favorite passages from Buddhist uh, literature sutras, suttas, texts. And I love that call forth as much as you can of love, of respect and of faith. And then it's taught, the Buddhism is taught, the Dharma is taught for the wheel of the world. It's taught for no other reason except to alleviate suffering. And it's for heroic spirits intended. So I think it takes courage and a degree of heroism to roar your truth out into the troubled world, out into any world, but certainly out into a troubled world. It takes a sense of commitment and courage to be willing to speak out about what we believe in, to be willing to challenge the things that we see that we, we feel need challenging, and to be willing to stand up for our values and to stand up in the face sometimes of quite strong forces that are working against our values or that are working in a way that is creating a world that we don't perhaps feel comfortable or happy with and to be able to kind of do that in a way that's effective I think takes courage and it takes heroism and it takes love and respect because there really is no other way to tackle the kind of issues the, the, the problems of the world. So what does it mean to roar our truth with love and respect into a troubled world? But before thinking of what does it mean, I guess there's a question which is, is it important? You know, is it important that we do that? Because we could just come along, I, you know, I've no idea, don't know your backstories, most of you. I don't know what's propelled you into practicing the Dharma. I don't know whether you've come to practice the Dharma out of a sense of pain, dukkha, unsatisfactoriness with life or whether you've been propelled into it because you've got a wonderful life but you know that there might be something more they tend to be the kind of reasons that that we're propelled into practice so it could be that that's enough you know that we feel like the best I can do is to get myself to be a bit more sane a bit more kind of able to cope with the world etc and that's absolutely fine that's a level that's important and necessary often but I actually am of the school of thought that thinks that that isn't quite enough that it isn't quite enough to work to alleviate as it were our own dissatisfaction or our own suffering but that actually part of our practice part of the commitment of practice is to also try to help create conditions that alleviate suffering in a more general sense that actually maybe in a particular sense there might be particular ways that we choose to do that or maybe it might be through teaching the dharma so that other people also have access to to being able to work with themselves, work with their mental states, work with their dissatisfaction or it might be that we choose a more we choose something that's in the world in a certain way and it's to do with how we we interact. So I'm going to read you another quote. Sorry, I quite like quotes, but this is actually from Bhikkhu Bodhi, who's a hero of mine. So Bhikkhu Bodhi is an American Theravadan monk who I think is just ace. 
And this is from, I think it was an article that he wrote for, uh, interestingly, for the magazine called The Lion's Roar. So it's part of his Lion's Roar. And he's talking, he, so yeah, he's coming in a little bit into the article. And he says, I believe if we as Buddhists are to adequately respond to the needs of our age, we have to rise to the challenge. It won't suffice merely to adopt Buddhist teachings as a route to deeper self-fulfillment. A predominantly personal approach to spiritual growth falls short of Buddhism's ethical ideals and it misses half the message. Greed, hatred and delusion are not only in our mind, but in the food we eat, the gas we put into our cars and the movies we turn to for entertainment. Add Netflix, Amazon, etc, etc, etc. The Buddha taught the Dharma on the basis of a far-reaching vision that pierced the depths of suffering in both its personal and collective dimensions. He offered his teaching not only as a method to tame the mind, but as a standard for ennobling us in all dimensions of our being, including the social, political and economic. His discourses on lay ethics, communal harmony and the duties of a king are testimony to a panoramic awareness. So, I, I absolutely agree with that. I think that it's, um, I think Western Buddhism can sometimes be a little bit overly inward looking. And uh, while we need to have that sense of an inward looking part to our practice, personally, I think it's important that it's balanced alongside something that makes, that, that brings our meditative experience into the world. And, you know, what are the issues in the world that we might be concerned about, we might be worried about at the moment, maybe there are things that are playing in our mind. I probably don't need to read the whole list because I imagine that we all of us have our own things that affect us and that, uh, you know, that we get wound up about the issues that we care about deeply. But just to say, you know, for me, the, the, there are questions of discrimination, of prejudice and all its kind of forms, whether that's homophobia, transphobia, racism, disabilism, all those, you know, I don't want to uh, minimise them by giving them labels. I think the main thing is that we, fa we face so many situations of prejudice in the world. There's the whole question of war. There's a question of the, the huge amount of people who are displaced at the moment through war. There are more refugees and asylum seekers this century than there have ever been before, just even in the last 20 years, in the last 10 years. It's a huge issue and it's, it's compounded by the environmental crisis. The environmental crisis is driving people from their homes. You know, sometimes people say, oh, the environmental crisis is a long way down the road. No, it's not. It's probably a long way down the road for some of us that live in more privileged situations. It's not a long way down the road for many, many people across the globe. Questions of poverty, questions of inequality. Right now, we're living through a global pandemic, which is global. And until everybody is able to be treated the same through that, in a way, there's a problem there. It's not really good enough for the kind of more, you know, rich nations to say, oh, well, you know, most of our population is now vaccinated. We're fine. Thank you very much. It's not like that. I think one of the things that the COVID pandemic has really shown up is the interconnected nature of our experience, even just geographically, globally, it shows that up. And I think it also highlights the geopolitical inequalities. You know, people say, oh, we're all in the same boat with COVID. We're bloody well not in the same boat. Oh, sorry, I swore and I'm being recorded. We're not in the same boat. We might be sailing on the same ocean, but, you know, some people are sailing in great big cruise ships where all the wonderful kind of, you know, food supplied and et cetera, et cetera. And some people are hanging on for dear life in rafts. 
you know, it's not an equal, there's no equity in so many areas. So, you know, it, the whole kind of climate crisis, environmental issues, they're not separate issues. I do firmly believe that they're all these issues. There is a lot of intersectionality, a lot of coming together around these issues. You know, until while there's injustice anywhere, there's injustice everywhere. You know, until we can really face prejudice, whether that's in terms of race, colour, creed, religion, whether it's in terms of sexuality, gender, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then there is it, there's inequality. And I would argue that these are not political issues, that they're actually moral issues, they're ethical issues, and they're human issues. So as a practicing Buddhist, with a kind of strong belief that an ethical practice is important to my practice, I personally feel that my ethical practice needs to be more than just trying not to swear, which is quite a big part of my own personal ethical practice, especially since I moved back to Glasgow. But also, you know, trying to live as ethically as possible in my own little bubble. I feel I need to be aware of the global implications as well as the local implications to my ethical practice. So I would argue they're human questions and not even religious questions. They're just human. How do we live together in this world as human beings alongside other humans and other non-human beings in a way that actually creates a context for growth, for care, for love, for solidarity? So I think at the bottom of all that, there is a dharmic analysis that it's important to, to apply. So again, as I say, I don't know how deeply into your dharma practice some of you are. Maybe you're new, maybe you've just done a level one course and sailed up to regulars night, sangha night for the first time. And I know that some of you have been practicing for a very long time. But I think anyway, if you found the Dharma and you found it meaningful, then probably one of the things you found meaningful is the kind of Dharmic analysis of the world, of our issues, of our problems. In other words, to actually be able to look through a Buddha, through the lens of the eyes of the Buddha, and to actually look at some of the issues that we're having to deal with, not through the polarized vision of left or right, for example, socialist, non-socialist, whatever those polarizations might be, but to actually try and look at them through the lens of the Buddhist teaching of greed, hatred and delusion. So the Buddha taught 2,500 more years ago that we, we all have within us greed, hatred and delusion, three basic poisons. It's become very clear, I think, as time's gone on, that these poisons are not only felt or experienced individually. So all of us are working with those mental states of anger and desire and all those things. But actually, they're bigger than that. You know, David Loy, who I also have a lot of time for as a, an author, as a writer, he talks not only about the ego, but about the we go which I really like. So not only are we in some way trying to protect a sense of self-identity, but we group with others whose self-identity might chime in some way with our own self-identity, whether that's a family group, whether it's, um, you know, a group of, um, you know, nation, nationhood, uh, whether it's racial, whatever, and, you know, the, or whether it's, just the people that we like, like and not the people that we don't like very much, whatever it is that we create as our not only our self-identity but our group identity, there is there's a very strong human, and it's not even to be um it, it's not even something to to feel ashamed about because it's a very natural human tendency to protect whether that's protecting oneself or whether it's protecting the bigger self, the kind of group self in a way. But whether it's a human and understandable tendency or not, the Buddha taught that actually most of our problems will arise from 
follow in those tendencies of greed, hatred and ignorance, that that's where those things will come from, whether it's on an individual basis or whether it's in a broader sense. And I think we can see how that happens in terms of nation states who need to defend something against other nation states. And you even get the preemptive strike, whether that's on a personal level, I'm going to get them before they get me, or whether it's in that global sense of like we need to be defended. 40 miles up the road from here, we've got nuclear warheads. You know, Fast Lane has nuclear warheads. If there was ever a war where that was bombed, Glasgow's toast. Edinburgh's toast. Forget the central belt of Scotland. You know, do we really need that sort of thing? <laughs> anyway. Sorry, that's one of my own little pet things. But um, you can see why there's a belief that some people really genuinely hold that that's needed, that we need to have those things 40 miles up the road. I mean, why they have to be 40 miles up the road from Glasgow is another question. But there is a strong belief in some people, good people, who genuinely believe that we need to have nuclear things as a deterrent, because if we don't, somebody's going to, get one over on us. It's exactly the same thing as me thinking, well, before somebody gets something over on me, I'm going to make sure I've got what I need to defend myself. So it kind of builds up, doesn't it? So ego clinging, whether it's the ego clinging or the wego clinging, is the source of much of our problems. You know, it arises, desire, greed means that we believe this sense of having a separate self. Aversion or hatred means that we'll push away anything that, that threatens that. But actually, ignorance is the basic one where we even just believe that we have this separateness, that we're not connected to all other beings. So in the shorter discourse on the lion's roar, the reason that the Buddha claims his lion's roar rests upon a doctrine, and it's upon the Buddha's understanding of the nature of reality and what he's saying in this sutra is that the teaching of Paticca Samudpada, the teaching which is the basic teaching of the Buddha, the, the basic teaching of that is what separates the Buddha's teaching from other teachings. And this isn't in a kind of, hey, hey, look, we're the best, we are the best. It's not in that kind of sense. It's much more like, well, if we really want to get to liberation and we really want to get to the end of suffering, then this is the path to the end of suffering. So the lion's roar is in the jungle to make sure that all other creatures can hear that teaching, that all other creatures can actually be given the great privilege of hearing the Dharma. And the doctrine that it rests upon, there's a whole argument in this shorter Lion's Row Sutra, and where the Buddha shows that the essential key to liberation is the teaching of anatma, of anatta, of non-self. It's the teaching of the fact that we do not, even though we believe there to be a separate self, that in actual fact, the Buddhist teaching says, everything arises in dependence upon conditions. As those conditions change, so too does each phenomenon change, whether that is the galaxy or the atom, whether it's me or whether it's a world situation. Everything has arisen in dependence upon causes. There is nothing within that that is essentially separate from everything else. Sorry, it's a you know slightly complicated teaching to go into in two minutes, but that is the teaching that marks the difference and is the lion's roar. So when the lion roars at night, it's a song in that, isn't it? When the lion roars at night in the jungle, when the Buddha teaches, when the Tathagata comes forth and proclaims the Dharma, what is being proclaimed is we are not separate. There is no fixed and separate self. And to the extent we can loosen that belief in a separate self, whether it's in an individual level or in that bigger, more global level, actually so much will fall away. There is no need to defend ourselves. There's no need for an internal nuclear deterrent when I feel threatened and there's no need for something 40 miles up the road. 
it's actually up the road like that, not up the road like that. So that is crucial to our understanding of the problems of the world and how to attempt to work with these issues. So in, you know, sometimes we hear, uh, you know, that like, we want to bring Buddhist values into the world. And I think it's easy to think that means that we want everybody to become Buddhist. And I don't think it does mean that. I mean, for one thing, it would be extremely unrealistic. <laughs> but also, why would you want that really? I mean, you know, that isn't the kind of bottom line. I'm not out to be a missionary. I used to think I'd like to be a missionary, but that was when I was a Catholic when I was 10. It's all changed. So it's not that we're sort of suggesting missionary activity. I think for me, what's really being said is to the extent that I can live my Buddhist values, then I can be an influence for good in the world. And for the extent that I can actually bring those values into relationship with other situations that I find myself in, then hopefully those values can affect something, can affect change whether it's in a very minuscule way or whether, you know, I'd love to think that it could even be in a huge way. And I think it's worth remembering how much permeability there actually is between a Sangha, a Buddhist community and the world. You know, we're all part of a million different groupings of people. We all have an effect. You know, we've got much to offer and much to learn from all those kind of situations that we find ourselves in relationship to. And I think that's one of the things that's quite important. I think this century, and as Western practitioners, you know, practitioners who come from more or less from a generally Westernized background, whatever ethnicity that might be, we come from a globally Westernized, industrialized, postmodern world on the whole. I think we've got much to learn about current world issues from a lot of the contemporary analysis that are out there, whether it's, you know, um, philosophy, psychotherapy, feminism, environmental studies. There's much to learn, and I think it's important that we do have that permeability. You know, and, you know, one of the things, sorry, I'm probably going to go over time slightly here, but I think, you know, I have a look around the world politically at the moment and it scares the living daylights out of me. I really am quite scared about some of the things that I see. You know, some of the countries in other parts of Europe, Poland, Hungary, a massive swing to the right. India, massive swing to the right. And by right, I don't just mean people who choose to vote conservative. I think that's a whole other, I don't mean that. I mean the much more far right kind of populist Trump, you know, like out there conspiracy theorist kind of right. And it's actually quite scary. I think in Poland and Hungary in particular, you can see that a lot of the rights, to use that term, a lot of the, the kind of um, movement that's happened over the last half a century is being rolled back. You know, all the gay rights, LGBT rights have all been rolled back. Equality for women being rolled back. The bringing in of extreme fundamentalist Christian values or extreme fundamentalist Islamic values. In a way, it's not particular to religion, it's particular to fundamentalism. I think that's really quite scary. And uh, one of the things that worries me is how do you tackle that without just taking the polarised position? So that's, I think for me, that's a real question about how do we as Buddhists, how do I as a Buddhist practitioner relate to some of those, uh, those things that I see happening around me in the world? And I think one of the things that for me is a lesson is how important it is to bring Buddhist values into relationship with these questions. Because I think there's a danger of a, for me, there's a danger in my Buddhist values getting a bit swamped by the kind of um, political or the, I don't like the term ideological because it tends to be used in a very particular way, but, you know, not try and not to bring in worldly responses, even though they are worldly issues that we're dealing with. 
In a sutta called the Dasadama Sutta, it said, I am no longer living according to worldly aims and values. This should be reflected upon again and again. So for me, as a Buddhist practitioner who has quite a lot of relationship with political party, have quite a lot of relationship with activists of different sorts, I, I, for me, it's important that I remember I'm no longer living by worldly aims and values, that by having committed myself quite deeply to a Dharma path, then I went to make sure that that's what I'm bringing in. I don't mean I kind of, hey, I'm a Buddhist, by the way, you know, can I just tell you a bit about Buddhism? But, you know, I, uh, I have quite a lot to do with the ruling political party in Scotland, as it were. And, uh, you know, people say to me sometimes, it's really great having you in meetings because you're very objective. I'm actually not at all objective. I'm incredibly opinionated. But I have learned over the years to be able to open myself to different views and different points of views and hold that in a way. And I think polarisation is possibly one of the biggest issues that we have to deal with because the more entrenched a becomes the more entrenched B becomes, it becomes harder and harder to have any dialogue there. So, uh, oh gosh, mm, time. Um, I will just quote a little bit from the Bodhicharya Avatara, which is another Mahayana text where uh, about polarization, where Shantideva, who's the author of this beautifully poetic but deeply philosophical work says, virtue is perpetually feeble while the power of vice is great and extremely dreadful. If there were no spirit of perfect awakening, what other virtue could overcome this? So what I understand him to be saying there is you can't really deal with polarized problems from a polarized position. You know, you can't really deal with the forces of darkness by being a force of light in a polarized sense. You can't really kind of deal with those. You have to take it somewhere above other than that. And this spirit of perfect awakening is the bodhicitta. It's the heart of awakening. It's this beautiful spirit. It's the heart of the overcoming of the separation between self and other. And it's the breaking down of the identification of me and mine at the expense of them and theirs. So that's the heart and the spirit, I think, of the response to the world's issues coming from a, a dharmic perspective. So things I think we need to look out for a little bit um, if we are trying to work in a way where we're tackling injustice or polarization or racism or any of the isms that we might feel that we see and we'd like to learn how to kind of tackle those things. I think one thing to remember is even if we think that there are demons, you know, treading the world at the moment, the demon of poverty, the demon of very extreme fundamentalism, is to not demonize the people who might hold those views. And I think that's quite a hard path sometimes to walk. I think it's very easy to identify certain views, world views, world positions with the people who espouse those. And of course, of course we do that because that's where we come into relationship work. But I think it's important not to demonize those people and to try to keep a heart of meta where we're able to respond with love, even while we might criticize and analyze the positions that some of those people would hold. And I think also, as I've said, it's important to get the balance so that the Dharma isn't serving our social action, but our social action is an expression of our Dharma practice. So the lion's roar can sound a bit challenging, and it is challenging because it's a willingness to stand our ground and to stand up for what we believe in. But it's a kindly roar as well. That doesn't mean it's a wimpish roar. It doesn't mean it's a meow. It's definitely a roar, but it's a roar that comes from a heart of kindness and a heart that wants to alleviate suffering. So in that quote that I read at the beginning, it said, Gotama roars his lion's roar in company and in confidence. They question him and he answers. He wins them over with his answers. That is so important. 
So confidence in what we really believe in and the values that we're living by. But he wins them over by dialogue. He wins them over by finding common ground. He doesn't win them over by, you know, beating them into submission or winning the debate or something. And it's so hard. I find this so hard. You know, I have to confess I'm on Twitter quite a lot. And Twitter is a total hotbed of polarisation. It is virtually impossible to have a conversation. So I read something that I really disagree with and I take time and I write a very reasoned response <laughs> and then I get piled on by God knows how many people and I'm accused of being all sorts of things. I've stopped doing that because I've realised it's not a forum for having reasonable discussion. <laughs> <laughs> every now and again I manage to say something and somebody will go oh I hadn't thought of that and I think yay victory the lion's roar but generally speaking I just think yeah don't even bother but I find if I'm sitting in a room with somebody it's a very different experience and I think it is important that even where we might disagree with people that we try to find common ground because the Buddha managed to do it he won them over with his answers and then they found it pleasing. And how lovely is that as a kind of an aim that I would like those people whose views I think are totally bonkers and absolutely outrageous. I would love to be able to come into relationship in a way where they found it pleasing, you know, rather than that they just felt worse because they've just been shouted at from the other way. So I think that's really important. So I think kindness and empathy are crucial in any way that we try to deal with, with world issues, world problems, you know, or even local problems, maybe even problems in our family. Maybe you've got a family member who've got views that you find absolutely awful. You know, how do we keep in relationship with them as people, as another human being, as, you know, somebody who has other views but probably seeks happiness and its causes in exactly the same way as I seek happiness and its causes. So that doesn't mean we collude or even agree where we don't, but to find a way to keep our heart open to the person. And remember, as the Buddha said, that hatred never ceases through hatred in this world. It's through love alone does it cease. So a revolutionary actions need to be based in love. Uh, just before I finish, can I give you a Che Guevara quote? Because I like that. So Che Guevara, revolutionary, you might not agree with his politics. I don't agree with his later politics, but there was some stuff that he came out with, which was pretty good. He says, at the risk of seeming ridiculous, let me say that the true revolutionary is guided by a great feeling of love. It is impossible to think of a genuine revolutionary who lacks this quality. I absolutely agree with that. I agree that the true revolutionary has to be a revolutionary walking in a path of love. So a path of truth, a willingness to speak truth to power, as they say. And I think that's a really good expression. You know, to be worth, to be willing to do that in this, to seek the truth in this world of such misinformation. So that's my kind of opening to BAM. Actually, BAM's a very, if you're in Glasgow or in Scotland, BAM is a very unfortunate expression because it's what you call somebody who's, you know, a bit of a BAM. So like, I'd say Boris Johnson's a bit of a BAM. But anyway, BAM in this context is totally different. It's Buddhist Action Month. I think it's important that even if we have Buddhist Action Month, it's not just for June. You know, it's a way of highlighting something, but, you know, it's not just for, you know, as I say, puppy's not just for Christmas. Bam is not just for June. So the lion's roar, it's a great theme. The lion is a proud animal. And I'm also well aware that June, as well as being Buddhist Action Month, is Pride Month. So a little call out to anybody here from the LGBTQ community. And that's all about pride and being who we are. And I used to think it was pride in not being, you know. I think it's very easy to see anything which deals with oppression as being in opposition. But it's no, it's a willingness to be who we are and to stand our own ground. So the lion is proud. This is Pride Month. 
you know, let's be proud of who we are and the values that we espouse. And just to end, to say that nada, which is the roar, or rava, it's also a song. And Karen Nagita mentioned in her, in, that her name means she who sings the song of uh, compassion. So the Buddha's lion's roar is the one who sings the song, not just who roars the truth, but who sings the truth. It's got to be joyful. So a revolution, a radical revolution, needs to also be a joyful revolution. We need to sing and dance our way to the revolution as well as roaring. Thank you. That was 40 minutes, so. <laughs>